And the truth of the matter is, we could talk about the resurrection uh, honestly every Sunday uh, between now and, and the Lord coming back. And I guarantee you, we would not say everything important about the resurrection of Christ. I do want to look at a familiar passage today, but I want us to look at it in perhaps just a little bit of a different way. But uh, the, the title of the message is, He is not here. To me, that is one of the most astounding statements that was ever made. When they came to that garden tomb and they saw the stone rolled away. And then the angel speaking, saying, He's not here. He's not here. What an astounding statement of reality. Let's uh, stand together. We're going to read uh, Luke 24, beginning with verse number 1. We're going to read through verse 8, and then we'll go to the Lord in prayer. The Bible says this, Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared, and certain others with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher. And they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. And it came to pass as they were much perplexed thereabout, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you so much, Lord, for your precious word. And I pray, O oh God, that now you would just have complete control of this service. May you speak to our hearts. May you stir us by your power. And I pray, O oh God, that if there's anyone here today that is not 100% certain that their faith and trust is in Jesus as their Savior, Lord, may today be their day of decision. Stir every one of our hearts and lead us closer into a walk with you as a result of being here today. And Father, we'll thank you and praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much. You may be seated. You know, I got to thinking about this and, and gave it really, uh, spent a, a good amount of time over these last days working in my mind about, uh, you know, this particular message. And I got to thinking about the reality uh, that, uh, you know, there are many, many pivotal moments in history that we deal with. Many got to thinking about some of the ones that are very important, and uh, and and, uh, and and to realize that you know think about this. D-Day was a pivotal moment in history when our forces landed at Normandy Beach, and uh, we ended up uh, going and and fighting in in uh, Europe and defeating the Nazis and then going into the Pacific theater and and def and defeating the, uh, the the Japanese that was a pivotal time July the 4th 1776 when those guys were willing to write down their names on the declaration of independence that was a pivotal moment in history Appomattox courthouse was a pivotal moment in history. There have been many pivotal moments, but none of them compare to the resurrection of Jesus from the cause of death. Now try to imagine. I like to do this. I like to put myself in the shoes of the people that the Bible is talking about and, and try, to, uh, try to, to, to imagine what they must have been thinking about. Here they are. This group of, of ladies... On their way to the tomb, they're carrying spices. The purpose of those spices were they were going to anoint the body of Jesus. As far as they were concerned, their Messiah had died. And as far as they were concerned, their Messiah was still dead. 
They were on their way to the tomb, and, and there was a discussion we see in the other gospel accounts. Uh, who's going to move the stone? How are we going to get in? We've got to do this. This is our way of showing respect for, uh, for the one that, that we trusted had been the Savior. And they're on their way there to see Him and to anoint His body. And all of a sudden, I mean, they're filled with dread. They're filled with sorrow. I mean, they're heartbroken. They're disappointed. All of those gamut of emotions that they were going through. And as they get there, all of a sudden they look ahead. I don't know exactly what the terrain was like. But in my mind, I see them sort of coming over a little bit of a rise and looking down to the tomb. And one of them says, look at there. The stone has been rolled back. And then they quickened their pace. And as they got there and they began to look inside. And again, you look at the other gospel accounts and you see, you see that the clothes, that the, the, the robe uh, the, that Jesus had been wrapped in was there. As if the body had just left it behind. And then the interesting thing is the napkin that was over his face had been folded and put in a separate place. And they're looking at it say, and they're probably saying, what in the world? And all of a sudden then, these, uh, these, these two uh, individuals that they don't know who they are appeared and they looked at them and they were a fright. They were frightened. By the way, if you and I were there and all of a sudden somebody showed up in a, in a, in a, in a tomb uh, that we did not see enter and they're just saying, hey, be not afraid. What's you and I, what are we going to do? We're going to be afraid. And they said, don't you remember? Remember what? Remember what he said. What was that? He's not here. He's alive. He rose again, just like he said. And they said, oh yeah, he did say that. Wow. He is not here. That is one of the great statements that was ever made throughout history. He's not here. Now let me give you some thoughts here of what that means and how that applies to you and I. To you and I. First of all, think about this. The fact that he is not here means that the price for sin is paid. The price for sin is paid. You know, a, a lot of times we think of something like uh, death. And we think of death as, as some great monumental tragedy. You know, over the years, uh, I, I, I don't do much of it anymore because I just don't have the time. But when I was much younger, I would like to, I would like at times to read different philosophical works and, and different things that people would write just so I could get an understanding of what they were saying. And, and I can remember one particular writer saying one time, Oh, what a tragedy it was that Jesus of Nazareth died the way that he did. He had so much potential to change the world. How sad that his life would be ended at the age of 33. And I thought to myself, you poor, deluded knucklehead. You missed the point of the whole thing. I mean, listen, he came for the purpose of dying because there was a price to be paid. What this philosopher did not take into account is the fact that three days and three nights later, he got back up again. He rose from the dead, conquered death, and because of that, I mean, the price for sin was paid. You see, it was not just merely a monumental tragedy. I got to thinking about this. I've been reading a little bit about it. Uh, they've had the uh, one of the uh, brothers that, that survived, uh, the Sarnaev brothers that was responsible for the Boston Marathon uh, uh, bombing. That was a monumental tragedy. The death of Jesus was not a monumental tragedy. You see, the death of Jesus was God's answer to our sin problem. We, we have, we've got a debt. We can't pay. We can't pay it. You ever, you ever get one of those situations where your bill comes in the mail and you say, Boy, I don't know where the money's going to come from for this. 
this because I don't have it. We got to send that that we are incapable of paying. And Jesus stepped forward to pay our debt for us because we couldn't pay it for ourselves. You see, the blood of a perfect sacrifice had to be offered. In the book of Romans in chapter number 5, uh, take a look beginning with verse number 6. This is so crucial. It says this, For when uh, we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commendeth His love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, much more than being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. Boy, isn't that good? I mean, by His blood, we are saved from wrath through Him. That's what it's all about. The blood of a perfect sacrifice had to be offered. And you know the neat thing is Jesus is both our sacrifice and our high priest who offered up His own blood even on the heavenly mercy seat forever to be a testimonial there that He's paid the price and, and we are, uh, our sins have been covered by His blood. In the book of Hebrews in chapter 7 uh, it says this, and, and I love this passage. Hebrews 7 and verse 24 says this, but this man because he continueth ever hath an unchangeable priesthood. You know, isn't that a neat thing? He, he, he has an unchangeable priesthood. He's never going to die. He's never going to have to be replaced. It says, wherefore, in verse 25, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. For such a high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself. Wow. One price is paid. No more debt. Nothing else to deal with. It's been paid. And as our sacrifice and as our great high priest, he ever lives to be there and to be our mediator between us and the justice and righteousness of God the Father. He's not here. The price of sin has been paid. And then he's not here. Human perplexity. Is turned to faith. The Bible says in our text that as they went along, they were, they were much perplexed. They found the stone rolled away, and they entered in and found not the body of Jesus, and they were perplexed. And behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. They were much perplexed. Oh boy, I look at that and I say, boy, I guess so. You say, what does that mean? I mean, they're sitting there going... That's perplexed. What in the world's going on? Wow. What's happening here? But their perplexity was turned to faith. You see, think about this. Think about the purpose for Jesus. Think about all that Jesus did when Jesus came to this earth. The Bible says, you know, the, the, the light shined in darkness, but the darkness comprehended it not. It was a sin-darkened world that Jesus came to. By the way, if you haven't figured it out yet, we still live in a sin-darkened world. That the only solution for them is Jesus. That's it. It's not philosophy. It's not uh, religion. It's not ritual. It's not some, uh, some other kind of concept. Buddhism won't do it. Hinduism won't do it. Islam won't do it. Denominations uh, that call themselves Christian won't do it. The only thing that's going to do it is faith in a risen Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's crucial. 
He turns perplexity into faith. Why? Because the life of Jesus brings, uh, brings hope to a darkened world. I can look back and, and see Jesus in His life and read what Scripture has to say about His life and say, bless God, if Jesus can, can, can deal with the things that He dealt with, then there is a way for me to stay faithful and do what I ought to do. And the death of Jesus provided the perfect scapegoat for our sins. Scapegoat. I, I love that term. It's a biblical term, by the way. You know, uh, a lot of times we think a scapegoat nowadays is I do a crime and pin it on somebody else. They're the scapegoat. Did you know the way that God established this whole concept for the scapegoat? Jesus fulfills it perfectly. Back in the book of Leviticus and chapter number 16. Let, let me read a few verses here. It's going to sound a little bit weird, but I'm going to try to put it together for you. In, in Leviticus 16 verse 7, it's talking about the high priest here. It says, and he shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. And Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell and offer him for a sin offering. But on the goat on which the lot fell to the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement for him and to let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. Drop down to verse 21. It says, And Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat, and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel, and all their transgressions and all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat, and shall send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. And the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities into a land not inhabited, and he shall let go the goat in the wilderness. You say, preacher, that's got me totally confused. Well, let me sort of put it together for you. High priest would come out, two goats. He'd, he'd cast the lot. You say, well, what was that? That was just a way of choosing which one lives and which one dies. One goat is killed and offered as a sacrifice. The other goat, they literally, in a symbolic way, confess sin and put the sins of the people on that other goat and send it off into the wilderness. Now here's the picture. Jesus fulfills both. Jesus not only was the one that sacrificed Himself, shed His blood, paid for our sin debt, but Jesus also, by the fact that He rose again and He's alive, one goat died. The other goat lived. He came back to life. He's the living one. He carried our sins far away Amen. and never to be remembered. You know, there are several passages in the Bible that I love. One says, God shall take our iniquities and cast them behind His back and remember them no more. God shall take our sins and cast them into the depths of the sea and they'll be remembered no more. As far as the east is from the west, that's how far our sins have been separated from us. Jesus is our perfect scapegoat. Wow. If that don't excite you, take your pulse. You may be dead. I mean, think about it. I mean, the death of Jesus, sin offering, the living Savior guarantees our sins are carried away. And the resurrection gives purpose for our life and a sure eternal future. In the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, here the Apostle Paul in the church in Corinth was dealing with the subject of the resurrection. Some people were beginning to say already, Oh, the resurrection is not that important. Doesn't matter whether Jesus rose again from the dead. I mean, what's the big deal? So the Apostle Paul addressed it. In verse 6, 16 of 1 Corinthians 15, he says, For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. I got news for you. Following Jesus is more than just a lifetime vocation. Following Jesus is an eternal reality. 
It's not just for now. This is just the warm-up phase. One of these days when we leave behind this earthly existence and enter into the presence of the Lord Jesus, we'll be able to enjoy His presence forever. Why? Because He rose again. He didn't stay dead. So He's not here. Human perplexity has turned to faith. He's not here. The pain of death has been conquered. You know, I made a comment this morning in Sunday school. Um, I don't mind dying. I just don't want to have to go through the process. I'd like for the Lord just to come with the shout of the archangel and the trump of God. And, uh, and, and buddy, I'd just go on up with him. Amen? Amen? That'd be a whole lot better as far as I'm concerned. But I don't know what the future holds. All I can do is trust God in the meantime. But I want you to understand something. Jesus suffered in one afternoon what would have been our agony for eternity. Isaiah 53, 6 says this, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. You know, the agony that Jesus suffered on the cross was not just because of his physical suffering. Although, from what I understand, crucifixion was probably the most hideous, painful method of execution that's ever been devised. You know, they didn't have anything like lethal injection in those days. They wanted it to be a spectacle. And Jesus hung there with the agony that he felt in his physical body. But the worst part was the spiritual agony. And we find him even crying out saying, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's when God the Father put the sin debt of the universe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Wow. You see... Because of that, only Jesus has the power to remove death's sting and grace victory. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 55. Oh, I love this. I use this a lot of times at, at funeral services for, for people that I know are believers. But I love this passage. It says, Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. I've shared this before at funerals, but the great evangelist of years gone by, Dwight L. Moody, was, was sick and was getting close to the time of his death. And some of his associates were gathered near his bed, and D.L. Moody looked up and he says, Now, gentlemen, it won't be long you're going to see a headline that says D.L. Moody is dead. He says, Don't you believe it? I'm going to be more alive than ever. <laughs> Listen, if you've got your faith and trust in Jesus, you don't have anything to fear in death because of the fact that the pain of death has been conquered because He's alive. And then He is not here. The promise has been fulfilled. What did Jesus come to do? Luke 19.10 tells us. It says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save. That which was lost. Mission accomplished. He came to seek and to save. You see, the only responsibility you and I have is to turn to Him in faith and say, You paid the price. You did it. Therefore, I'll trust it. It is sufficient for all. It's efficient for those that are willing to say yes to Jesus. That's crucial. Not only that, He came to show the way. Great, great passage. In Matthew chapter 4 and verse 19, when Jesus was choosing his disciples, notice what he said to a few of them. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. You see, we got a job to do. Jesus fulfilled his promise. Jesus did exactly what He came to do. And now we have a responsibility to... to uh, we've been commissioned by the Lord Jesus Christ to point others to the empty tomb. That's our job. And listen, He's coming again. 
And the Bible says He comes again and His reward is with Him. But in the meantime, we're left here to do a purpose. We're left here to do a job. And you know, I was reading this about two weeks ago. I was sitting in my study one day and I've got a, a book on prayer and fasting by Ronnie Floyd. And I was reading this book and he gave an illustration and it just gripped my heart. He said, in days gone by, there was a man who was awaiting execution. He was going to be hung for crimes that he had committed. And at the last minute, the king decided that he would give that man a pardon. And so he wrote out the pardon, sealed it with his signet, gave it to a servant and said, run quickly to the jail and give this to the jailkeeper because I've decided to pardon this man for his crimes. Now get there quickly. And boy, that young servant was so excited, he grabbed that pardon in his hand and, and took off and got to thinking to himself on the way, oh, this guy's going to be so excited to find out that the king has pardoned him. This is going to be so good. This is going to be so wonderful. I get to see the joy of on his face when he sees the pardon from the king and he's so excited about having a pardon in his hand but as he walks as he's hurrying along all of a sudden he passes by a place that has selling clothes and he says well I'm just going to stop in here for a few minutes I'm going to get him a new set of clothes because I mean getting out of jail he wants to look his best so he buys him some clothes he takes off again and all of a sudden he passes by a bakery. And he says, oh, I think I'll stop in here and get some fresh bread and some other stuff. So he has something good to eat. And he gets that, uh, that all gathered up. And, and he's heading out and he's got the clothes and he's got the baked goods in his under his arms. And he's carrying the pardon. And he runs up to the jail and runs into the where the jailer is and hands him the pardon. And the jailer opens it up and begins to weep. And says, oh, young man, I'm so sorry. But we hung him five minutes ago. And that young man, as he began to walk back toward the palace, the only thing he could bring himself to say was, what's the king going to say? What's the king going to say? I had a pardon, but I didn't get it there on time. What's the king going to say? Let me just give you something to think about. The good news of the gospel is only good if it gets there on time. We've got a job to share the gospel with people. By the way, if you're here today and you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior, let me give you a great truth. You got the news on time. Jesus came. Jesus died. Jesus rose again. All we ask is that you believe in Him. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth on Him should not perish but have everlasting life. You got the news on time. What you going to do with it? What you going to do with it? Will you receive it? And then, who else do we know that needs to hear about the love of Jesus? Oh, we all know somebody that needs to hear about it. Will we get the news there on time? God help us. Let's do so. He's alive. We got good news to share. He's alive. The price is paid. He's alive. No perplexity instead of faith. He's alive. Let's share the good news of Jesus. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you so much, Lord, for your word. The great truth that not only did you die for our sins, but Lord, you, ro you, you rose again. Thank you so much. You're coming again.
Thank you so much. God help us. May we seize the good news in time. May we share the good news in time for those that need to hear it. Have your way and will now, Lord, in this invitation. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. The world is full of light and darkness, good and evil, life and death. Oftentimes in our own lives, we experience a lot of pain and suffering. Our family members and friends pass away beyond our reach. And we can feel that our lives are spinning out of control. I think what we need to understand first is we've been created by a God who loves us, who cares deeply for us. He's ordered all of our steps and knows everything about us. Our sin, our rebellion has caused the evil and pain and suffering in the world. We've rebelled against that loving God. I think at this point we can honestly ask ourselves, what hope do we have? The Bible actually tells us because of our wrongdoing, because of our sin, we deserve death. But God has not left us just to ourselves without any hope. He's provided a way of hope and a way of life for us in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus has paid for all the wrongdoing, sin in the world in order to provide a way of life for you and I. In the book of Ephesians, God's word tells us, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. Part of salvation means that we trust Christ for our way of hope and our way of life. We submit to God's commands and instructions found in the Bible. We believe that He has paid for our sin on the cross, that He has defeated death in order to provide us life eternal. In order to receive salvation, you must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved.